talking about that thing. So, you know, it's not a cure-all solution, but um, it's, it's just, I want to put it in your head that there are lots of conversations happening on the web right now in various places that involve subjects that you're involved in, right? So part of maybe what you can think about is mining for where that is. Now, there are some out-of-the-box solutions that can help you mine, that can help you automate the process, but there are also just some, like, you know, you can do hashtag search, you can do, there's just a lot of simple ways to gather that, and that can be part of a project, and it's very legitimately part of a lot of projects that are very data-driven, but it's, it's actually pretty low-hanging fruit in terms of the way social um, platforms Forms are organized in terms of finding people having conversations about what it is. Now, in some instances, obviously, there are not going to be people having conversations, or you might not want that those conversations to float into your project because it might, you know, make your sense whatever idea you have kind of it might corrupt the idea that you have in the first place. So it still requires curation. It still requires authorship. So that again, you don't get released from that. You don't get released from your activism. You don't get released from your authorship. You still have to do all those things. But there are things things out there that are that make that process perhaps maybe like a little more efficient. So I'll, I'll just put that out there as like kind of the maybe silver lining and trying to do some participatory work. Just one thing I wanted to add, both those comments uh, sort of reminded me about, um, I think there, for, for folks who for just sort of like trying to make sense of interactive world, I think there's a really useful lessons in uh, in radio, um, and radio is probably the first interactive mass media, um, or modern mass media, and if you, I think I've learned a lot from listening to like Brian Lair, which is a, on WMYC in the morning, and other talk shows that are really, really good um, with audience interaction, um, I think is an incredible lesson uh, to think about when you're planning the user experience experience of interaction even on a two-dimensional space um, or you know it's arguably two-dimensional I suppose but even in the even in the digital space because they're a good a good radio host has a really good is really adapt at like at honoring interactions at like at um, you know encouraging interactions and I think it's just really useful to think about so yeah, and, and one other thing I just wanted to say on that is um, one of the reasons we changed the name of the department to interactive rather than digital is uh, another thing to think about is it doesn't necessarily have to be digital either. So with Priya Shakti, uh, it's mostly, a lot of the work has been done through printed comic books which are being distributed in India because they realize that that would be something that would be you know readily available and they're getting money to, to fund that. And then they are doing these beautiful murals. Now, if you do have a smartphone, you can also get this AR experience with a comic book and with the murals. But if you don't, you're not excluded from that, from that experience. And I think that's something that we're often think, that we're thinking about more and more now is interactive doesn't necessarily mean zeros and ones. And when you're thinking about access and literacy and who your audience is, sometimes it's actually paper. And, and one of the things that I think has been like really eye-opening for me being in this space is, you know, as much as I come from a film background, I come from a television background, um, that, you know, there are, there are places where 70-minute documentaries are never going to go. And that is not to say that 70-minute documentaries aren't a wonderful thing to be doing, but there is a spectrum of storytelling. And I see a lot of this interactive work now being on that spectrum where you've got beautiful 70-minute films, but you've also got comic books being distributed in India um, to kids, both boys and girls. That's one of the things that I think is so amazing about Priya Shakti. Yeah. I, this is getting back to the thing I was mumbling first quickly, which is um, you want to think about the right form for your work, and the right form might not be that cool thing you just saw on the internet. It might be something else, which is why I recommend very highly to just keep an open mind, look at all different kinds of work, because a comic book with an augmented reality app on top of it is maybe the right form, and maybe you don't have to make a web series or, or something. virtual reality, or virtual reality, <laughs> or yeah, other things. But then sometimes it might be might be um, the perfect thing as well. But you really want to explore and think about what the best form is, because again, if you can imagine it, someone can make it for you. And I know the Priya Shakti project pretty well for a couple of years, and they found a nice partner who kind of made an app already, so not saying it was easy, but relatively simple. They didn't have to reinvent the technology. It already existed. A company right. had already made it. They didn't build the AR. They just used Blipper, which already exists. Um, okay, I said we were going to leave tons of time for Q&A, but we didn't. Sorry. <laughs> um, we're going to have to wrap up at 6.30 in five minutes' time, otherwise you guys are going to go crazy and rebel. I can feel it. Um, so who has burning questions? Um, so I have a question. Um, that you've all sort of already begun speaking to, that, um, you know, 
you know, when I when I started working on the film that I'm working on now, I, I it began as an idea, but I always knew it had to be a feature length documentary. I just knew it had to be a feature length documentary. Um, and I've never made an interactive uh, project or really even thought about it until this panel. So thank you. But um, <laughs> from a sort of social um, social impact activist perspective. Um, how do you decide, or when do you know, whether something makes more sense as an interactive project or as, as a feature-length film? Because, you know, it's not that feature-length documentaries don't, don't do, I mean, we all know that there's been this explosion in, in sort of social impact strategy and all kinds of stuff around feature docs, too. Um, so, so how do you, you know, when you're doing that initial kind of nascent, I have this idea, what are the sort of, um, you know, things that you sort of way against pros and cons. I mean, how do you know that something makes more sense as an interactive project? Like you? I to me, you. usually just when it doesn't feel linear. I mean, I think, you know, once things, once the story starts to kind of expand in a way that isn't a straight line or a couple of straight lines that can be kind of interwoven in one direction, like that's the point where, you know, when I'm in discussions with different kinds of content makers, like that's when I start to think like, okay, well, you know, how do you, how do you approach the storytelling of this subject matter from a more lateral or a more interconnected sort of multi-directional kind of approach? Um, and so if your exploration of your subject matter is such that, you know, you're not following one subject through the experience of one particular, you know, issue or whatever it is, or, or a community or a group of people, and it starts to feel like there are sort of offshoots and tangents that are going in different directions, or there are ways that, you know, you can encourage participation from a community of people to actually contribute to that story in a way that feels really organic, that, you know, contributes something not just kind of interesting, but significant to the subject matter, like that those to me are kind of the, the signals, the little bells that go off in my head. 